Hi everyone, my name is Robin Lewis and this is my new dining table. It's the first time I've attempted a round table and whew, learned, <laughs> learned a lot along the way. It's got some cool features on it. On the ends are these steam bent curved strips of solid timber. They're contrasting colors. The lighter one is Vic Ash, the darker one is Morton Bay Ash. The legs use angled mortise and tenons and then over here you've got some significant termite damage which are filled using epoxy. So I am super excited about how this turned out. Let me show you how I made it. Okay, I have a fresh cup of coffee. Let's get into this narration. So if you watched my steam bent chair video, you would have noticed that I had a solid wood steam box. That thing just about exploded by the time I'd finished with it. So the first thing I did for this project was create a new steam box, this time out of plywood. Spoiler alert, it worked so much better than the solid wood, but I guess that's to be expected. One of the improvements that I made to this box was to add small feet on the inside so that when the timber went in, it would get steamed more evenly. Now, these are the three Morton Bay ash slabs that I'm gonna be using for this project. Two of them are gonna be for the strips. One of them is gonna be the inside of the circle. So I started by cutting one edge, jointing it, and then I could get all of the strips out of this. From a steam bending point of view, it's interesting to note that this is air dried, not kiln dried. You can see that I've marked out these grain lines on the end grain of the board. This is really important to show me which way I need to bend it. When you bend strips like this after steam bending them, you should bend with the grain orientation. So this board should bend that way so that the, the grain lines curve around. Now this is the contrasting timber that I'm going to be using. This is Tasmanian oak. This has been bought from the big box store and it's kiln dried. I have bent this in the past but because I'm going to be bending it at this thickness, 19 mil, I'm going to have to soak this for quite a while and then hopefully that should work fine. With this chasm <laughs> of a hole, there's no way I'd be able to do this, this pour in one go. If I was to fill it up with epoxy resin now to the top, it would get really hot and it would most likely bleed through that tape because the weight of the epoxy would just pull the tape away from the wood. So a better way to do this, and I got this idea from Macromona, is you just mix up a small amount and get a thin layer across the bottom everywhere. And then once that sets up, that will hold the rest of the layers of epoxy in place. It's been about eight hours and this epoxy pretty solid, it's, it's, it's pretty firm. It's not fully cured, but I can go ahead now and get started on the rest of the pores. At that stage, the epoxy had fully cured, so I pulled off the tape and then I could start making the bending form for the steam bending process. But while I'm doing that, I just wanna do a quick plug for the podcast that I co-host with Joey from King Post Timberworks and Brian from Sawdust Bureau. It's called the Shop Stool Podcast. We've interviewed some amazing international guests over the last few weeks. So if you are looking for another woodworking podcast to listen to, one that focuses more on the Australian and Kiwi market, I'd really like to recommend that you check out the Shop Stool Podcast. I'm probably a bit biased, but you know, I think it's pretty good. Back to the bending form, I go to a fair bit of trouble here to get this as smooth and consistent as possible. You don't want any sharp points because that could be where the fibers break. And you also don't want any strange undulations that could imprint on the wood. So you want to try and get it as smooth as possible. This round over is for the ratchet straps to come around. And then I also drill some holes for some clamps to fit into. Okay, today is the day that I start steaming all of this timber and, and start the bending process. This is incredibly nervous, this moment, because if I get the first one out of the box, try and bend it and it snaps, it's just, it's just like such a bad start to the project. So I'm really crossing fingers that all of this goes well. I'll probably film the first one and then maybe one or two after that, the bends after that, but there are a few of them, so I'm not gonna film all of them. I would steam three strips at a time for two hours at 100 degrees Celsius. And here you can see I'm bending one, but later on I go ahead and up that to two at a time. You can see here as I pull it out the, the curve, and it's actually quite a gradual curve. So I might have gone a bit overboard with the, the steam bending process. I probably didn't need to go to so many lengths, but at least I knew it would work. And then once the piece had dried for a couple of hours, I would take it off and put it onto a drying form where it would sit until I needed it. 
I did all the Morden Bay ash at once, and then once that was done, I moved on to the Tasmanian oak. So again, similar process, but you can see here, I'm bending two at once just to speed things up. And then once the last boards had been steamed, I could just lift the bending forms off, use those as the drying forms, and sit those to one side. So earlier on, I talked about one of the Morton Bay ash slabs going into the center of the table. This is some Vic ash, which is gonna be the contrasting color. So I'm building up the slab here. So it comes in at around 300 mil wide. With both of my two internal slabs ready to go, I cut a straight edge on the Morton Bay ash and then flattened it. Now, unfortunately, I had to cut off more material than I wanted to in the flattening process, but in hindsight, it was actually a good thing because I ended up with a much lighter looking table that was a bit more elegant. So I'm actually happy that I ended up at, uh, I think it was around 22 mil instead of the 28 or 30 mil that I was shooting for. The next job was to get a pattern that I could follow to cut the curves on the inside pieces. So I wanted this as precise as possible. So for that, I went to my good friend Scott's place from For Me Industrious, and he cut a perfect curve on his CNC machine. So once again, a very big thank you to Scott from For Me Industrious for uh, doing this cutout for me. Now I've got to take this and draw this curve and cut this curve out on this Morton Bay ash. Then I could use the bandsaw to cut up to the line, not on it, but up to it. And then I could thickness the boards down so they were both the same size. What I'm doing here is trying to remove as much material as I can before I do the pattern cut. You'll also notice that I'm using my drum sander here. I got this tool specifically for Morton Bay Ash because it is impossible to run this through my thicknesser without getting chip out. Being my first time using a pattern bit, obviously I've still got a lot to learn and the tear out on this is, well, it, uh, let's just say that's a testament to it. I know one of the things I've done wrong is I'm essentially climbing up the grain, which is gonna be pulling it out. There's not too much I could do. Other thing that I could do, I guess, would be to switch to a, um, an up or down cut bit or a compression bit. This was just a straight bit, so that's probably making it a bit worse. But that's okay, this is the underside, so it's not the end of the world. Once I've glued it together, you won't even see this. Okay, so now that the curves are cut on the center pieces, the next thing is to start gluing the steam bent strips onto those. Now, depending on how they've sprung back, it's gonna determine where in that line they're going to get attached. So, so I've got all of them here ready to go. I've drawn some lines on my workbench to help me grade their spring back, how much they've sprung back. That way I can sort them into some piles and that's gonna determine which ones get glued onto the inner radius first. I glued each strip individually, giving the glue around two hours to set up. And then almost immediately after saying five clamps is enough, <laughs> I've had to throw on one, two, three extras uh, just to pull in some of the gap. That's all right. And then 10 strips later, I ended up with one half of the table, flipping it up now. And then you can see what I'm working with. So this is essentially one half of the blank. I could then repeat the process again. You can see I'm using that backer piece with the correct curve. I'm so happy I saved that from one of the cuts. And then I could go through the same clamping process. Here you can see the order that I would add the clamps. So starting in the center and working my way out. And then finally on the last strip, I would glue in this dowel. This was just to hold the strips in place while I was working with them. That last strip would have had a tendency to want to pop out. Once both the halves were dry, I then brought them together, put some glue on the inside, added some of these coils just to keep them as flat as possible, and then added one clamp in the middle. The way I planned the edges for this join, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, was to create a side gap in the middle so that as you pull that middle in, it forced the edges, the outside edges, really tight. And so it creates a very strong glue join. Then I could find the center of my new blank and using a very <laughs> rudimentary compass, I could draw a circle that was bigger than my final dimension. My next step is gonna to be to flatten this. So I wanna cut off as much excess material as I can using my circular saw. This is another example where I'm making use of these window packers. 
I swear by these things, they are the handiest thing to have in the shop. I'm gonna be using these one and a half mil packers just to lift this side up ever so slightly. You can see I've got the line here for the final dimension of the table, so I'm gonna be cutting close to this line using a jigsaw. Once that's done, I'm gonna take this router base, attach it to this piece of wood, put a single pivot point on that end, and then I can rotate that around, coming right up to the line, doing the final cut. I found the center point and gave it a pivot and now I'm about to cut the final size of this round table. I've never used this method before but can I just say this is one of the most satisfying processes you'll ever do. I'm using a down cut spiral bit here which went a long way to make this a very clean cut and you'll notice that I stopped just short of the bottom because I didn't want to blow out those fibers. Okay, so the tabletop is done, it's sitting over there. We're gonna to get to that a little bit later. The next job is to work on the legs, and for that, I'm gonna be using this Vic Ash. They come out of these wider boards quite nicely with very little waste. Because I'm cutting up wide boards though, I'm going to cut the rough shape of the legs out of these boards and then leave it for a couple of days. That way if there's any tension, it can um, move and twist as it wants, and then from there I can either flatten it again or put the piece aside and cut something else. So with all of the boards looking pretty stable at this point, I started the milling process. Just a lot of milling, 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 some jointing, some thicknessing, getting everything down to the size I wanted. After that, I could cut a 12 degree angle on both ends of the board and then get started on the mortise. To get rid of the majority of the material, I used a drill press with, I think this is an 18 mil spade bit. And then I could come back with my router and cut the inside of the mortise. This gives you a very, very clean internal face. And I'm at the point where I need to start making some cuts based on some measurements, which is what I'm doing now. This whole round dining table leg assembly is something I've never done before and it is, whew, yeah, there's a lot more to it than I thought. There's two possibilities that you can go. The one is to bring the legs right into the middle. That way you have a large overhang. But the problem with this is that your knees then have the tendency to hit these legs. So the, the other option is to then pull them further out, further out. You now lose that overhang of the table, but you can get your legs through. The issue here is you need to make sure that these are wide enough now for your thighs to slip through. Now that I decided how long I wanted the rails to be, I could create this small jig with a 12 degree angle on it that I was gonna to use to cut the tenons. I'm cutting the tenons using a router, so this jig is gonna be the fence that I run it against, and this is gonna allow me to get that 12 degree angle consistently. Now that I've made this first cut, I can take my combination square, set that between this edge, this cut edge and the fence. And now this will be how I set this fence for the rest of the cut. So as long as I keep this combination square set, then my fence will always be the same distance between this edge and this edge. So my shoulder will always be in the correct place. So with a bit of finessing with the chisel, I got the fit to where I wanted it. You can see the rail goes in and then I can lift the other piece up. That's pretty good. Next up was the half lap join in the middle where the two rails were gonna cross. I started by cutting with a handsaw and a bandsaw just to get rid of the majority of the material. And yes, then it's back to the router to finish up that inside edge.
Then I did a lot of sanding of all the parts. Okay, that's enough sanding. And then I could get on to the glue up. I glued up the two halves of the leg assembly separately. And what's nice is because of these angled tenons, you could just put the clamp on, cinch it together, and then it would automatically get the legs into that correct angle, into the correct position. And then with the two halves all glued up, I could glue them together in the middle with that half lap join. I've created another half lap join, similar to the first one. It's oversized, so now I can think about cutting it back in and deciding how far inside of the edge of this table I want it to be. Now the way I'm going to attach this top piece to the legs is with some dowels running through. So what I could do is on the drill press, drill through with a six millimeter drill bit, then line up this cross piece onto the legs and then come through again with a bigger bit, an eight millimeter bit, and then that would run through into the legs. So it's going to be perfectly lined up. And the reason I started with a six millimeter bit is I find if you run a drill bit through a hole multiple times with your final bit, that's going to expand it. So saving that eight millimeter bit for the final step and only drilling through once meant the fit would be a lot tighter. All right, just one more thing to do. I'm so close to finishing this now. I am so pumped. This cross piece has to be dialed in place in each one of the legs. And I'm gonna glue this half lap joint in the center at the same time. To finish, I'm gonna be using a hard wax oil. Now this is something that I haven't tried before, but there's so many people using it at the moment and it seems like such a fantastic product. I thought I'd give it a go. So I've got these two sample pots here from Whittle Waxes. I've got a satin and a matte. Now I've gotta be honest, when they sent me these little bottles, I thought, well, this is fantastic, but I'm not really gonna get very far with these. But I've finished the underside of the, the top already and I've only scratched the surface of this tub. It's amazing how far it goes. So I've got these two bottles. I'm gonna be using the matte as the first coat and then I'll switch to the satin after that because that's where I wanna finish. And I'll probably do three coats, uh, but I, I don't know. I've never used this tub before, so I'll, I'll see how this goes. Then everything got a light sand with 400 grit paper and I tried doing the final coat with that pad that you saw me using earlier, but it just ended up very blotchy and inconsistent. So then I switched to the roller and I got a much better finish. Then I could bring all the pieces upstairs and attach the top to the base using some figure eight clips. I'm attaching everything on this island bench that I built a couple months ago. There'll be a link in the corner to that video if you're interested in seeing how I made that. So this turned out to be more of a journey than a project. It literally took months to build just because of external factors, but I finally got here and I am so pumped with the end result. There's a lot of stuff that I've learned along the way. If I was to do this again, I would do certain things differently, but the overall result, definitely happy with it. So if you like this video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you enjoy these types of videos and want to stay up to date with the content that I put out, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe. My name is Robin Lewis. Thanks again, and I will see you guys in the next video.